I want to welcome you to our third Institute Encounter, sponsored by the Institute for the Study of Western Civilization of the Honors College here at Texas Tech. Our guest today is Professor Alan Charles Kors, who is the Henry Lee Professor uh, at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And among his many other achievements is one of the world's outstanding authorities on an exceptional turning point in the history of Western civilization, the Enlightenment. Uh, and what I'd like to do today, he will be lecturing a, a little later uh, on the subject of the emergence of the ideal of religious tolerance, which of course is part of uh, the Enlightenment. But what I'd like to do today is talk to him about the Enlightenment as a great cultural, intellectual, and political uh, project uh, more generally than that. So um, why don't we just kind of start off by um, describing what in fact the Enlightenment was. What kind of episode in human history does the Enlightenment mm -hmm. constitute? Uh, the Enlightenment can be looked at in several different fundamental ways. Uh, one, it is the popularization and the extension of the extraordinary philosophical scientific revolutions of the 17th century um, to areas where few in the 17th century thought they would be applied. Um, it is a, a moment where the rejection of the presumptive authority of the past not the rejection of the authority of the past or of authority, but of the presumptive authority of the past, breaks down not only on issues as it had in the 17th century um, of physics, uh, on astronomy, on fundamental philosophy, but where the presumptive authority of the past breaks down in terms of how one thinks about human societies, uh, about economics, about trade, about religion, um, about religious toleration, uh, about moral values. Uh, and that makes it one of the most intellectually revolutionary movements uh, in the history of European thought. Uh, it also is a remarkable movement that often described itself in a term that originates in the 17th century as the Republic of Letters, uh, where it will not be birth or inherited position um, that determines one's place in the intellectual world, uh, but it will be one of merit and one in which uh, all comers are welcome and equal to try their hand uh, in the world of ideas. So might one say that with the Enlightenment, as you've just described it, uh, no longer the presumptive authority of the past, the past isn't jet jettisoned, but uh, we no longer take it as the uh, kind of absolute authority that it, that it a long time had been thought to be. Uh, that you now have a kind of forward-looking culture. I know the, the ideal, I think perhaps the, uh, the term, uh, progress, mm -hmm. certainly gets wide currency mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in the Enlightenment. Um, is, 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 is that something that, that dis accurately describes the kind of turn of mind? And if so, um, what prompts uh, that new mm -hmm. way of looking forward rather than back? Mm -hmm. uh, First, you're absolutely correct um, about looking forward and the drama of that occurring. Um, a very good example of that is to look at criticisms um, of arbitrary monarchical authority. If you look at the criticism of the reign of Louis the Fourteenth uh, at the end of the 17th, beginning of the 18th century, uh, where he's perceived as tyrannical, as uncaring about the well-being of his kingdom, uh, the criticism is always backward-looking. 
to an idealized king as father of his people, mm -hmm. an idealized medieval mm -hmm. uh, French king. If you look at the criticisms of absolute monarchy that emerge with Voltaire, with the Montesquieu, um, it's based, those criticisms are based on the assumption um, that we can learn from the past and present um, and project that into the future. So Voltaire's criticisms um, of the absolute French monarchy are not looking back to an idealized French model of king as father of his people, but he looks at England and he says they've achieved the balance of power. They've set restraints of law upon monarchy itself. Um, they protect commerce and value commerce. And all of his criticism of the French monarchy is based upon a notion that there are models there. In Voltaire's case, England. Uh, in Montesquieu's case, often lessons learned from Roman history. But there are models there that allow us to talk about how one can change structures of government. So, so there's an idea that, that politics and social structure can be changed, that people can make choices about it, and also that there's a plurality of models, both present and past, and maybe even outside of Europe, uh, that you could look to um, in determining what course should be followed, is that? Uh, that seems to me uh, exactly right. Uh, and it's not accidental that in the course of the Enlightenment you have extraordinary interest in and admiration of um, Confucian ethics. Um, and what we're seeing as the past achievements um, of the Chinese in governance. Uh, that you have admirers even uh, of Native American cultures um, in the Enlightenment. Uh, but above all, it is this sense uh, that there is no need for fatalism uh, in human knowledge and the application of human knowledge. Uh, in the 17th century, there were authorities that had stood the test of time. And the assumption was, if anything had been wrong in Ptolemy's astronomy, people would have found it by now. Uh, and this was true in field after field after field. The 18th century didn't reject Euclid because Euclid was an ancient. Uh, they greatly uh, admired the intellectual achievements um, of ancient Greece and, in some cases, ancient Rome. Uh, but the sense was that that was the infancy, that far from being the ancients, that was the youth of mankind, and that one could learn by cumulative experience. I think the key to this is a sense of the discovery in the 17th century of a different sense of uh, the scientific method. Uh, that one learned from experience, from the creation, from the book of nature, not just from the books of ancient men. Uh, when Galileo said, you're reading the wrong books, don't read the Greeks for astronomy. Read the book of nature. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, Francis Bacon, a hero of all Enlightenment thinkers in the 18th century, Francis Bacon in the 17th century had said that method was like a path to where you wanted to go. And brilliance was fleetness of foot. You could put a great intellect on the wrong path, and the person would, with dazzling speed, move himself farther and farther away um, from acquisition of truth. You could put a plotter on the right path with proper method, and he could add to the knowledge that we had. Uh, the great sense also uh, that the 18th century inherited and then secularized 
from the 17th century was that knowledge should be applied uh, with charity. Uh, it's a constant theme of the 17th century. For the 18th century, that becomes, for the Enlightenment, that becomes for human betterment, for the elimination of remediable causes of human suffering um, and the enhancement of human well-being. Uh, I can draw another instance of that that I think is very revealing, uh, again from Voltaire, who initiated a campaign for inoculation against smallpox uh, in France. It had been adopted by the British. The mortality table showed uh, that inoculation worked. Uh, the French monarchy directed the issue of inoculation to two faculties, faculty of theology, faculty of medicine. Uh, faculty of theology said man shouldn't play God. You can't give someone a disease, which is what inoculation does. Faculty of Medicine ruled for decade after decade against inoculation, that it was a violation of the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm, uh, but giving someone smallpox was first doing harm. Voltaire argued, here we have confirmable knowledge about the effects of inoculation. Um, it can be applied. If it's applied, it will save hundreds of thousands of human beings from death and suffering and disfigurement. Uh, and that sense is not that far removed from Bacon's sense, that knowledge be applied with charity, but it's wholly secularized uh, in terms of Voltaire. So here you have this great upwelling, one might say, of human optimism, mm -hmm. uh, of intellectual optimism about the future and what it might hold. Uh, a feeling that the future is in the hands of mankind. Uh, do with it what it can, and mankind now has the methods for uh, finding a way to a increasingly better and better future. Um, uh, that's an idea, of course, that has a variety of potentials to work out, both, both good and bad, Indeed. Uh, as, as time rolls on. Um, but 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 you're you're kind of arguing that what what the critical thing is 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 apart from perhaps a, a a more generalized Western kind of openness to thinking about alternatives that maybe antedates the 17th century, the great breakthroughs of science. That so that really is the kind of critical model uh, for human advancement and progress that others are now trying That's right. to generalize. That it validates both the rejection of the presumptive authority of the past, <clears throat> it validates a sense that knowledge is cumulative, and that the application of knowledge uh, can achieve extraordinary things, uh, not only in removing water from mines um, and in medicine, uh, and in agriculture, uh, but indeed uh, in terms of human society and economics and appropriate forms of government, uh, but always with the understanding that a commitment to experimental and empirical confirmation entails a belief that you can be proven wrong that you can go down dead ends, uh, that you can learn from your own mistakes as well. Uh, another major side of the Enlightenment that is certainly uh, both powerful and dramatic in its effects on European civilization um, is the naturalization of world view. Uh, in the 17th century, this occurs within often very deep theological commitments, a sense that God's providence is revealed in the orderly laws of nature, uh, that a clockmaker who designed a clock that didn't need frequent repair um, was more worthy of theological awe than a being who constantly had to intervene miraculously. Uh, so you see in the 17th century um, a great increase in what is considered superstition by Christian culture. 
um, and a willingness to rely more and more in terms of explanation upon the laws of nature, upon a naturalistic world view. Uh, and this dominates enlightenment thinking. Uh, that we are instructed by nature, we learn from nature, that most things, if not all things, occur by means of natural phenomena and natural laws, and that these are our guides. And this often permeates uh, that side of Christian theology in the 18th century, because there is a Protestant enlightenment, there is a Catholic enlightenment, uh, and this view often permeates uh, uh, intensely Christian worldviews. Bishop Butler, the foremost moral theologian uh, of the Church of England in the 18th century, uh, confessor to the Queen, uh, uh, Bishop of, of Durham, uh, writes the most influential book of Christian moral theology, uh, his sermons on human nature. Uh, and he argues with great influence, I think, on people such as Adam Smith later in the century. Uh, he argues that God has so constructed the world that self-interest and benevolence coincide. Uh, that pursuing one's self-interest informed by conscience uh, and informed by reason. Pursuing one's enlightened self-interest leads one naturally to benevolence and to acts that even without that being your motivation um, lead to the betterment of mankind. And there is this sense of a providential order in nature. All for the best and as um, best of all possible worlds? Uh, for many, uh, primarily for the best in this uh, best of, of all possible worlds. But you're raising that issue uh, also raises a very real question that it is a caricature of enlightenment thought to think of it as having a blind optimism um, or even as having what people often describe as a, a faith in reason. The enlightenment is very powerfully concerned um, with the limits of human reason. Just think David Hume, um, who is beloved uh, in, in French Enlightenment circles as well. Uh, Voltaire, in his poem on the Lisbon earthquake, in Candide, raises the question of do we know that the God of nature is good? Uh, we know the world is designed. Uh, there's too much evidence of that for Voltaire. But do we have any reason to believe that the God who created it cares about us? Um, and he mocks the notion that this is the best of all possible worlds, arguing that said to the suffering, um, stand next to a victim of the earthquake in Lisbon who's holding a dying child against her breast and say, this is the best of all possible worlds. Good will come from this. Uh, the Enlightenment has a great deal of skepticism built into it, including skepticism about progress and skepticism uh, about the uh, powers and the force of human reason. Uh, and indeed of human science. Uh, Adam Smith, in his essay on astronomy, says all you can do is arrive at models that seem to work, mm -hmm. um, and you can't assume that mm -hmm. the human mind has captured mm -hmm. uh, what the universe is all about. Uh, that's not the way the Enlightenment is often mm -hmm. presented in textbooks. Um, Diderot explaining his emphasis on reason and the conflicts it has led him into with the church uh, has a passage um, in his uh, additions to his philosophical thoughts in which he said we find ourselves in a dark impenetrable forest and we have only the smallest lantern 
to guide us a little bit in the next step we take. Along comes a stranger who says, it's so dark, blow out your light. He says, that man is a theologian. <laughs> uh, and it wasn't that Diderot's enlightenment, uh, and he's a major figure, uh, editor of the encyclopedia that spreads uh, the, what the Enlightenment believes to be acquired knowledge and acquired method. Uh, it's not that he believes uh, that uh, the theologians, as opposed to the natural philosophers, uh, that uh, they know nothing and the natural philosophers have illuminated the world. It's, we do have this small little lantern. Um, don't blow it out. Let's uh, shift, to shift gears a little bit, uh, the Enlightenment takes root initially uh, in a relatively small number of European countries, then it spreads. Mm -hmm. um, France, England, Scotland, mm -hmm. the Netherlands, pretty mm -hmm. much is the kind of initial seat mm -hmm. of the Enlightenment. What, what is it about those particular societies? Uh, Galileo, after all, was an Italian, but mm -hmm. uh, Italy comes later uh, mm -hmm. into the Enlightenment. Germany comes mm -hmm. later. Uh, Spain, even later. Uh, what is it about uh, those societies, some Catholic, some Protestant, uh, that are seedbeds for this kind of thinking? Mm -hmm. uh, one, of course, the countries you mentioned were all centers of the great intellectual and scientific revolutions of the 17th century. So there is a predisposition to believe that one can reject the presumptive authority. So you have Galileo and Kepler and uh, people like that who are outside. But their, their fate, <laughs> right? Uh, their fate was quite different. different. And the, uh, the, the absence of an inquisition in all the countries you've mentioned greatly aids the Enlightenment, though in fact the Enlightenment will spread. Certain subjects are taboo, but the Enlightenment will spread to Italy. Uh, the Enlightenment will spread to Spain, Feijou. Uh, and in Italy, probably the most important work on the reform of the criminal justice system, uh, Cesare Beccaria's on Crimes and Punishments, which is immediately uh, translated into almost every European language, has extraordinary influence uh, in terms of the abolition of torture, um, the definitions of due process, the rights to trial by jury, the nature of punishment. Uh, Beccaria's work uh, is a circle in Milan that meets to read authors of the French Enlightenment, mm -hmm. and then Beccaria and his circle end up producing the most influential work on the law uh, in the 18th century. I think that the great media for the spread of the Enlightenment, underappreciated, uh, are the learned journals. Uh, with the extraordinary growth in the number of works being published, uh, the extraordinary growth in the number of publishers. People wish to be on the cutting edge of knowledge without having to read through massive tomes of new work. And the learned journals step in. They tend to give you a rather objective summary of an author's argument, points of view, claims of knowledge, and then criticism. But you're introduced mm -hmm. to the author. Uh, that spreads the Enlightenment dramatically. There is also the literary correspondent. For example, Diderot's closest friend, Friedrich Melchior Grimm, is also very close to Catherine II, uh, Empress of Russia. Uh, Grimm sends out a newsletter about intellectual life in Paris uh, once every two weeks. His subscribers are most of the courts in Germanic-speaking lands in the Holy Roman Empire. But his He's audience- reporting on the salons and on publications. On the salons and, and on publications, mm -hmm. that's exactly right. And Grimm is almost a perfect archetype of, of the French Enlightenment uh, and, and the life of the salons. And as one note, 
on this issue of optimism, pessimism, mm -hmm. uh, grim notes uh, in a positive review uh, on the issue of positive reporting on, on a work that had changed a lot of minds on the issue of toleration. Uh, he said, well, so we appear to have won the struggle for religious toleration um, in Europe. He said, but don't be overly optimistic. I suspect that what's coming will be a political intolerance that will slaughter at least as many innocent people. Uh, so what, what is the relationship of religion, of Christianity, to the Enlightenment? Um, Christianity participates in the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. uh, the Enlightenment, to some degree, critiques and rejects Christianity, mm -hmm. parts of it. Uh, and I think to some extent Christianity is Christian thought preceding the Enlightenment as a foundation mm -hmm. for Enlightenment thought. Could you describe some of that? Yes. Uh, first, it makes, I think, a very large difference whether one is dealing with a Protestant or a Catholic context. Um, if you think of France in the early 18th century, uh, it's only been two decades since they've expelled their Protestants, since they've outlawed Protestantism uh, in France. England is moving in exactly the opposite direction. Uh, when Voltaire visits England in the 1730s, what strikes him more than anything else is the religious pluralism of, of England. Uh, and he says something that I think almost every Enlightenment thinker on the continent would have agreed with. He says, if there were one religion, there'd be tyranny. If there were two, they'd cut each other's throats. But there are 30, and they live happily together uh, and in peace. Uh, also, censorship is much less severe um, in both of the Protestant countries you mentioned, Holland, uh, where it's least of, of all the European countries, and, uh, and England, uh, whereas in France, the philosophers, the philosophers of the French Enlightenment, believe that they must struggle for every right to be heard, uh, that the church would silence their voices. Uh, they also look upon the French Catholic Church of the 18th century um, as a human institution. Um, its upper echelons filled by the need to place aristocratic sons in places where they'll earn money, uh, where you have widespread absentee bishops, absentee abbots who pay truly pious people a pittance to run there. Uh, so for them, what they see as the institution of the church that they face um, is a flawed group of powerful people who wish to silence them. Anti-clericalism is probably the most common denominator of the French Enlightenment, which it isn't uh, in Holland, which it isn't um, in England. Uh, the great Enlightenment authors in Scotland and in, in England, uh, many of whom move so comfortably in the world of French salons, when they visit Paris, uh, they are very close to, to moderates in the Church of England, or moderates in the 18th century Presbyterian Church. Philosophical uh, divines. Philosophical like divines, uh, indeed. But there is, uh, dramatically in France, but also emerging in England in what are known as the deist controversies, uh, there is, as part of this re presumptive rejection of the presumptive authority of the past, uh, a strain, uh, as I say, dramatic in France, of anti-Christian thought, uh, a belief that there is now a God accessible by nature, um, that there have not been particular revelations. Uh, that one looks to general providence, the laws of nature, not the particular providence, a supernatural revelation um, at a given moment of time. Uh, 
the other side of the struggle, I think, between Christian intellectuals and Enlightenment intellectuals, uh, to a certain extent everywhere, but, but again, most pronounced in France. Uh, but France is the most influential of the Enlightenments in the, in the 18th century. France becomes almost a lingua franca um, mm -hmm. in German and indeed in Russian uh, intellectual circles. Uh, but the, I've lost the biggest subject of the sentence, but I think I can pick it up again. Uh, what, what you see emerging is a belief that Christianity is a human historical product of a moment of time and place. The English deists, though they are not representative of the English Enlightenment, they're really one of its most dramatic manifestations, um, argue that scripture clearly is written in different voices with different worldviews at different times, uh, that its science and chronology are questionable. Uh, you see these arguments yet more um, permeating almost all Enlightenment thought uh, in, in uh, France. Uh, Thomas Paine at the end of the 18th century in the Age of Reason uh, summarizes in effect the argument of the English deists. Uh, this man who left the United States for France, a national hero, only has about eight or ten people at his funeral in the United States because of the Age of Reason. Uh, because he has attacked um, Christianity as a, as a true religion. Uh, but again, I would look at all of this as part of the naturalization of worldview and the naturalization of providence, looking at providence. And if one naturalizes one's view of providence, it's general, not particular, uh, what that essentially rules out is miracle. And if you rule out miracle, the foundations of the Judaic and Christian traditions as intellectually defended um, in the 18th century are under assault because they are founded precisely on the notion of divine intervention in human history. Uh, and that is an unintended consequence of the 17th century's naturalization of worldview uh, that leads to the remarkable debates of the 18th century. Now, the Enlightenment is normally thought of as coming to a close at the end of the 18th century, uh, and people sometimes describe the 19th century as a kind of age of romanticism, as opposed, but we never really lose the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment no, continues to define yes. our civilization to the present. Do you, do you think we're in danger, uh, some danger of losing it now? Uh, what's, what's very interesting to me is that the great assaults upon uh, Enlightenment thought came first from those who associated it um, with the catastrophes, what they saw as the catastrophes of the French Revolution um, and the cruelty of the French Revolution. And indeed, the persecution of the Catholic Church um, by the French Revolution and what they saw as the anarchy uh, and the demagoguery of the French Revolution. Um, and there were those who blamed that upon the Enlightenment. Uh, the Enlightenment comes also from, from more political conservatives of the 19th century. Uh, certainly comes under assault um, from uh, the religious. Uh, it's deemed the font of, of irreligion. And so most of the attacks upon the Enlightenment come from conservatizing traditional tendencies. What I see happening now uh, is equally a great assault upon the Enlightenment from the left. Uh, out of the Frankfurt School of Criticism, deep thinkers um, whom everyone should read, Adorno, Horkheimer, uh, but out of the Frankfurt School, a view that the Enlightenment project had to do with human regimentation, um, with the securing 
um, of hierarchical structures. Uh, and if what one means essentially by the Enlightenment includes the notions of tolerance, um, of pluralism, um, of the search for objective and applicable truths, um, for attempts to limit power um, and find reasonable ways to restrain power. Uh, the Enlightenment ideal always being the rule of law rather than the rule of the whim of individuals with power. Uh, then the assault on the Enlightenment from the left uh, frightens me a great deal uh, because they are attacking, I think, uh, some of those sides of the Enlightenment that most enriched and that most liberated um, the European mind and European civilization. Well, thank you. Thank you, Alan, uh, for spending this time with us. Um, and uh, I'm sure uh, you all uh, enjoyed and were illuminated by that. Um, uh, our next guest uh, will be Ian Morris, a classicist who we'll have here in about two weeks' time. And until then, good afternoon.